happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. I sent Dennis Zen out to pick up some batteries, and in typical male fashion, <laughs> he ended up in Japan. <laughs> Also, here is Barry Nemroth. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, we've gone completely off the rails, and the show's barely even started today. Oh, we so went off the rails we're before be okay. the cameras started rolling. <laughs> and John Roca. Hey, guys. Uh, very happy to be back in the new setup. This is my first experience with this. I love that Ken Knapsack is screaming at Sinead right over her shoulder. It's the best. <laughs> as always. As always. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Just to be on a panel where everybody has relieved themselves and taken their morning <laughs> constitutional. Now we can start the show. I knew it was going there. Uh, no. We, uh, we could create an entire new show on this channel just before movie talk. It was called before movie talk. The five minutes before it would get the highest ratings. And that would be pulled off the air fairly quickly. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, as happens sometimes, an item dropped that we didn't have time to get into the sidebars here, and it has something to do with rings. Sinead, what's going on? Rings, the long-delayed third movie in the Ring franchise, is getting delayed yet again. The sequel that brings the series into the modern age has been pushed back again thanks to an announcement from Paramount Pictures. This marks the third time that Rings has shifted on the calendar, and while this year has shown us that horror can succeed at any time of the year, audiences are especially looking for it in October. Now the only horror film opening next month is Ouija Origin of Evil. Rings will now open on February 3rd, 2017. Mark, will Rings ever be released. I don't think so, and I love it. I, and this is a great strategy. It's just keep teasing us with it and then delaying it. 2025 is going to come. Will we see rings this year? No, you're not. It's going to be pushed back another three months. I don't understand why you don't just get this thing out at this point. It seems like they got really skittish after the reaction to the trailer was less than positive, and maybe Halloween isn't the best play. That's what I don't understand. This thing was going to come out around Halloween. If you're a bad horror movie, that's where you you want to land <laughs> and now you're gonna go to early february which i also understand is kind of the dumping ground for movies sometimes so it just it seems like they're really panicky it's not enough time to change the movie it's just enough time to get it off one release date and put it on somewhere else that they hope it's not going to smell too bad saying like the reaction to the trailer has been less than positive is like saying the washington redskins have played less than well hey, come uh, on. Uh, I, 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 I just want to throw that out there guys uh, i mean no look i think but wait a minute i think there is some genius behind the chaos here because i think i see what the plan is when you push it back six months, that means you got to release a couple more trailers to keep the hype going. Then you push it back again. Within four years, you've released all 97 minutes of this film, and you realize it was the most brilliant social media marketing campaign of all time. No, really, at this point, this thing just looks like a bloody mess. I mean, it's just an absolute mess. Will they release this thing? Yeah, they're going to release it at some point. Will it make this February release date? Probably because this is kind of considered, it's still in that window that's considered the dumping ground. Yeah. Get it out there, see what you can recoup from your losses. It, it's clear at this point the studio has no faith in this movie. Mm. I mean, at that this point, it's completely abundantly clear. I don't know, Ruka, what do yeah. you make of this? I, it just feels like whoever's, who's ever supposed to be releasing it has watched the film and seven days later they're dead. They keep dying and they <laughs> cannot release this damn film on the right time. I, this is crazy to me because it's not like the Rings franchise is this like un, untouchable, incredibly beautiful gem that you don't want to break. Like, just recently release it. Halloween, maybe you'll have a bad one, but the people who love horror will come and watch it and patronize it. Even if people who are like if iffy about it will still come because the first two Rings films are actually really good horror films. So why not give it a chance? Even as terrible, you're still going to make your money. You might as well do it now while the iron is hot. Is what you were saying, Mark. Like this seems the most logical time. So I don't know what they're trying to save, and if dumping it in February. Uh, is any way to save costs, it doesn't make sense to me at this point. You might as well recoup it as much as possible. Perry, is there any silver lining here? This is weird. I think if this announcement came before the trailer dropping, I'd be like, all right, mm, you know, they need that, a massage yeah. it a little. Maybe that's what they're doing here. Now I think that we're, we've almost just solidified the fact that we're going to end up with a Ouija 3, yeah. because I believe <laughs> that's, that's right. the only horror movie. And if, if Ouija 1 could wind up making enough money to earn a sequel with whatever year that came out in, and that was like the first of the series, this one now is kind of in prime position to clean up on yeah. Halloween week, and I don't think there's, I mean, there's nothing next month except, you know, boo a Medea Halloween. So, you oh, know, we've got no. a packed Halloween this year. They, they, they do want to avoid that. They don't want to get in the way <laughs> of Medea Halloween. But let me ask you guys, you know, some people are speculating online. Does this give any validity to the, the rumors and speculation that 
the performance of Blair Witch may have been an extra little nudge to Ooh. scare them off their release date. What do you think, Oh, Perry? I don't think that has anything to do with this. I mean, we're talking about two completely different months. And even though September is when you start to push, I mean, even in August now, if you're going by what products are in stores and stuff with Halloween stuff mm. and Halloween stores popping up. But September is when the tide kind of shifts and you start to pave the way towards Halloween and scary movies. So I don't think that they would look at that and be like, oh, if... If Blair Witch isn't doing good at that point, then that means we're not gonna do what that mm. that that thought process makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Also because it, it's a different movie, it's a different franchise. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't buy that at all, basically. If they were nervous about Blair Witch underperforming, then you want to release your movie on Halloween. It's like yeah, that's the one that's weekend when point. you know people want to go to a theater and be scared. Mm. Maybe this February 3rd release date has nothing around it for miles. I haven't taken a look at what comes out that weekend, and maybe there's no other horror movies, so they just want to corner the market then, as opposed to release it during a crowded Halloween. But I go back to what we said before. It's like, when you're afraid of Ouija 2 taking money from your movie, that's not good news. <laughs> and you know, and you know, the weirder things have happened, watch this now, February comes, it comes out in triumphant victory like the New England Patriots last night. Okay, oh, wow. what's the Boy. first, I, was that a stretch? Oh, Let's go to our first official topic of the day. <laughs> Young Han Solo directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller have just revealed that Bradford Young has signed on to be the film's cinematographer. Young got his start on the indie scene before moving on to 2013's Ain't Them Body Saints. Most recently, a Sicario director, Denis Villeneuve, enlisted him to shoot his sci-fi drama, Arrival. The yet untitled Young Han Solo film is slated for a release on May 25th, 2018. John, what do you think of Bradford Young as the cinematographer for the Young Han Solo spin-off movie? Aesthetic. I'm absolutely mm. thrilled this because one of the first things I remember me and Schnepp watched that Arrival trailer and one of the first things we said to each other, it looks beautiful. Yeah. Like it just looks beautiful. We were stunned by it. Look, bringing a great director on a film does not guarantee the film's going to be great. Bringing great actors into a film doesn't mean that it's going to be great. Great script doesn't mean it's going to be great. You've got to assemble a collection of pieces and this is a great piece. This is a young talent. The stuff he's done has been just superb. His work, he's got a terrific eye. I think he's gonna be one of these guys that we're gonna talk like, we often speak about like Michael Giacchino. He could be the next John Williams. 10, 15 years from now, we're gonna be talking about Giacchino much like we talk about John Williams. I think this guy is like the next great cinematographer we're gonna be talking about. So to hear him attached to my beloved Star Wars universe, I am stoked. Doesn't mean the movie's gonna be great, mm. but it is a great piece of the puzzle and that's a step in the right direction. Perry, what did you think? I'm so hyped about this. Have you guys ever seen Pariah? Yes! It's, oh my oh. God, it's such a fantastic movie. And part of the, there's so many reasons that's a great movie. And I'm surprised more people that were part of that movie aren't bigger names at this point. Mm. Actually, you know what? I think this might make him the biggest name that came out of that movie. But that's yeah, a movie maybe. where so many things are great about it. But part of the reasons it works so well is that he makes you feel like you're you're in New York, like you're in Brooklyn. He really creates that atmosphere and that environment. So to know that he can bring something like that to to a Star Wars movie is really exciting to me. And what a unique combination of people they have lined yeah. up for these movies. Because I mean, I don't want to I don't want to go ahead and start comparing franchises. But you know, when you have a cinematic universe, you want everything to feel the same to a degree. With the combination of directors and cinematographers I'm seeing on all the Star Wars movies, I don't see how that's going to be possible in the same way. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of connectivity in terms of the visual language, but these sound like movies where every single one is going to have like a really unique feel and voice, and I'm really excited about that. You know, what is really cool is that when you look at Episode 7, Episode 8, Han Solo, and even the uh, the upcoming stuff, mm -hmm. all different directors, but not just mm -hmm. that, all different cinematographers mm -hmm. now, and I think that's really fascinating. Anyway, Roku, yeah. you heard about this. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love it. I'm as ecstatic as you are, John, because to me, it's once again, it's the Star Wars universe taking a chance to expand its brand with different voices, different points of view, different, different artists, looks, different yeah. artists, especially Bradford Young, who an African American cinematographer. He's getting his shot because he's earned it. You've seen if you've seen Arrival, just the trailer alone will will give you will stoke you. Selma. Uh, if you've seen oh, yeah, uh, a mm -hmm. most Selma, yeah, yeah a most violent year, and even this documentary on Stephen Sondheim, Six by Sondheim, he did the cinematography on Audra McDonald's version of Send in the Clouds. The man is so gifted, and so I'm super excited to see what he can do. And if Villain Villeneuve uh, 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 picked him out to do Arrival yep. uh, and Sakara being one of my favorite films from last year, that is just the stamp of 
of approval for me. Uh, and the arrival, if you watch that arrival trailer, you can't help but feel that he that that, that movie is going to blow you away because of the cinematography. Right, Mark. and the, the injection of fresh yeah. energy that he's going to bring to the yeah. Han Solo movie is something I'm very excited about. Not just because of arrival in that trailer, but also what Roca talked about with Selma that he can do. It's not just like huge sweeping mm -hmm. shots. It's also like intimate close quarters, yeah. so you can have a little bit of emotion and storytelling along with the great visuals. He could take us to entirely different worlds that we're aware of in Star Wars, but we haven't actually seen on screen that much yet. I mean, imagine the new planets, different locations that we're going to be making Kessel runs to and from. This is so exciting. Maybe we go to Kashik. Maybe we go to Chewbacca's home planet. Maybe we get to see more of that, uh, the Cloud City planet. What's it called? Bespin. Oh, That's the one that it's called. You son of a Very man. exciting news. <laughs> All is, right. it, is it also interesting, though, one last thing is like, this makes it feel like this film is going to be a little more serious than we think, right? Because we think of Solo like rollicking, but all, most of everything Bradford's done is more serious, quiet, intimate, large, even a larger scale. Yeah, but don't forget quiet, who's intimate. directing it. Yeah. Right, don't right, right. I know that. But I, I mean, it might, they might be changing. I don't know. It just I, seems like a good a thing. A really cool thing, too, is I was just looking at old interviews that he did. And just two years ago, I think he had just won, you know, his second Sundance Award or something. Mm. It was right before Selma was coming out. Someone was doing an interview with him. And they're like, oh, now that you have two Sundance Awards and whatnot, you are probably getting calls from studios all over the place. He's like, no. Not, not really. Yeah. Yeah. Guess and what? Now look at where That's it is. That's about to change. Yeah, yeah. big time. All right, what's next? While hosting an IMAX screening of The Magnificent Seven, Collider's own Steve Weintraub moderated a Q&A with producer Todd Black, who officially confirmed that director Antoine Fuqua would be returning for The Equalizer 2, reuniting him yet again with frequent co-star Denzel Washington. The movie will commence shooting after Labor Day of 2017. Additionally, the film's current release date of September 29th, 2017 is clearly going to have to be pushed back since it looks like the sequel will begin shooting around that same time. Mark, are you happy to hear that Antoine Fuqua will be returning for Equalizer 2. Sinead, I would have been happy already, and after seeing The Magnificent Seven, I am overjoyed to hear this news, mm. because the way that Antoine Fuqua directs action, the way he directs Denzel Washington in particular, makes me want to see as many Equalizer movies as we can possibly get. Hopefully they don't go down the Taken 2 route. We don't have Maggie mm. Grace lobbing grenades from the top of buildings. <laughs> More action with Denzel <laughs> is always good news. What he did in Magnificent Seven, the way that Fuqua Shot, set up those action scenes, particularly that climactic battle that takes place over at pretty much the second half of the movie. I was so happy watching. I was giddy in the theater, checking out how it wasn't it wasn't relying on a lot of quick jump cuts and a lot of like you know the shaky cam and all that stuff. We actually just got to see great action set pieces. And The Equalizer is a movie I checked out again recently. The scene when Denzel comes in and the first time he confronts those crime bosses oh, and he just takes man. most of them out. Yeah. So Give good. me more of that stuff. Big fan of the first Equalizer. Can't wait to see what's new. Roka, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. I'm so stoked. I love it. I own it. I bought it on Blu-ray. Watched it again over the weekend. It's such a good... Like, it, it took a Denzel Washington vehicle and went to the next level with it. Fuqua really gave it its power and its drama, and it's over two hours. It's no, like, small movie. It actually goes there, and they gave Denzel the right villain to go against. It gave him the right, like, 19 seconds, that kind of thing. It's just really powerful to see him do that. And uh, Denzel talked about how the fact that he was looking for a franchise, and Black said that, too. Like, he wanted to go on something more than, he saw the Jason Bourne stuff, the Taken stuff, and he wanted something. And this just fits perfectly. They work so well together. And hearing, and reading all the great reviews Views for Magnificent Seven, it just makes me mm -hmm. even more excited to see this because it seems like this is the, uh, the right combination for both the director and actor. Barry? I am so excited yeah. for this. You want to know why? Want to know why, Wendy? Because you know what I did when we got back from our screening super late? She's like, don't do it. I watched The Equalizer for the first time last <laughs> nice. night. What a cool, fun, bloody, violent movie. Yeah. I love it. And if you watch our spoilers review of Magnificent Seven, you might know that I didn't love Magnificent Seven. I don't think it's bad. I had a lot of fun with it. But what really gets me excited about Equalizer is that to me, because maybe it's more character driven and more focused on Denzel Washington, that is a perfect example of a movie that never would have been the same way unless you had him in that lead role and Anton Fuqua directing that movie. And the two of them and both of how the way they work and the yeah. way they perform pairs so perfectly together. I am so excited. I just want more of that now. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't be happier about this. Here's the weird thing. You think about Denzel Washington and the storied career he has already had, and he's still got a long career ahead of him. This is his first mm -hmm. sequel. Yeah, He's never done a sequel before. Ever? How, how rare Ever. is that? Wow. 
in this day and age. So I think that's really cool. I, but seeing these two guys pair together again, I remember it was about, I can't remember, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, whenever The Equalizer came out. We were actually lucky enough to have Antoine Fuqua into the Movie Talk studios. This mm -hmm. is back when we were still at AMC. He came into the studio, we sat down, we did an interview. He was great, he hung out with us for a little bit for the afternoon. And then I walked out with him and we went down in the building we used to where we used to shoot movie talk, there's like this Hollywood Tower of Terror elevator uh, that we take. <laughs> My kind of elevator. So it was me, Antoine, and his assistant were in the elevator going down and he had a call come in as we were going in the elevator. He took it, he looked really happy. And then we got off the phone and I just said to him, good news. And he said, I just booked uh, I just booked a new uh, a new movie. I said, Oh, like, can you say what it is? He goes, No, but uh, it's a Western. Yeah. So we, I was, he was actually in the AMC nice. Movie Talk Studios when he got confirmation. I guess that. So you're saying because was going of ahead. you hanging out, <laughs> with I take full credit <laughs> okay. for that happening. You know, this is I love the first Equalizer. I thought it was the only guy who really liked. So I'm really excited to hear you guys liked it too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I absolutely love that film. I cannot wait to see this. All right. What's next? After years of uncertainty, Pacific Rim 2, now subtitled Pacific Rim Maelstrom, is finally and officially happening with Daredevil Season 1 showrunner Stephen S. DeKnight at the helm. Variety reports that Aftermath star Levi Meaden and Chinese actress Jing Tian have both joined the film with confirmation that production begins this November in Australia and principal photography also planned to take place in China. Pacific Rim Maelstrom is slated for release on February 23rd, 2018. Roka, your thoughts on the new shooting location? and actors for Pacific Rim 2. Okay, so this is interesting because I'm not a fan of Pacific Rim, so I like that the question came to be, as Dennis knows, we go toe-to-toe -to -toe on this all the time, Transformers <laughs> versus Pacific Rim. So then you're asking me, what's my thoughts on new shooting locations? I love that they're shooting in Australia. I love that they're shooting in China. Absolutely, big, big stuff, great expanse, large, wide stuff to, that you can use big cities to destroy. Why not? You're hitting the right markets. You're going to have a good time doing that. Actors, I'm a big fan of Levi Mead, and I, he was great in the last season of The Killing, which you can see on the Netflix. On Netflix, I was such a fan of that show. Uh, even though people tore it apart, it's, it was such a necessary show to have at that time. And he was great doing that, doing the arc that he had on the show. I can take or leave Scott Eastwood. I love that Boyega's on it so so much. And this Chinese actress Jin Tang, she's done like three or four films now, mainstream films, uh, Skull Island. Uh, I can't remember what the other film is. And she's got, oh, 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 Matt Damon's The Great Wall. She's doing that as well. So she's building her resume here across international uh, water. So why not give her a shot at this part? Um, I like tonight because of what he did on Daredevil. So I'm super excited that he's in charge of this and he's he's directing it. I mean, he's only done like six television, six uh, episodes of television total in his career as a director, but he was the EP on Daredevil and I love Daredevil. So I am totally now going to go see this when initially when they announced it, I was like, there's no way I'm gonna be in this theater. It's great that talking about Pacific Rim 2 allows me to interject some thoughts on two of my top five all time favorite television shows. Because sometimes when you hear, you're going into a secret here, the entire cast is gonna be different. Mm. And that would raise some concern. I really like the first Pacific Rim. I had a really fun time with it. And one of my top five all-time favorite shows is Sons of Anarchy. Mm. I just love that stuff. Yeah. You guys remember the Sons of AMC and the stuff we used to do, mm. and I love that show, and so I love Charlie Hunnam. He was bad. Mm in that Pacific Rim <laughs> movie. I'm a big fan of Charlie Hunnam. Can't wait to see him in this new like round table thing he's doing, but he was not, it was not his strongest work in that first Pacific Rim, right? So, you know, you're adding Boyega, you're adding all these guys. Yeah. Everybody talks Stephen S. tonight and they say Daredevil now. Screw y'all, okay. okay? He did Spartacus, <laughs> all right? He was the showrunner of Spartacus, which is I think my number three all time favorite show. The, the first four, three or four episodes, worst television ever made after that because one of the greatest television shows ever made, and he's bringing those sensibilities to this. I'm stoked about it, so this is good news for me. Perry? Roker, your facial expressions are really <laughs> making it hard for me to get past the fact that it's Transformers specific, right? Like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're crazy. This movie is so much fun. Ugh. I'm so excited. The second that they announced that this was actually moving forward, I've been counting down until we kind of put the pieces together and get closer and closer to the green light, because it's been a while since Pacific Rim 1 came out, so yeah. even though they were talking about it, I mean, Guillermo del Toro talks about everything, and some mm. things, most things, don't ever happen so I am so excited that they finally have a date and they're moving forward I'm just curious to see what happens with the old cast because there's so many conflicting reports and quotes at this point because right now we have nobody from the original yeah. cast officially locked on for the best and Charlie Hunnam has said he's not coming back and then we've got Guillermo del Toro saying no we're gonna get a lot of the original cast back so <laughs> 
what what's going on here? I mean, the fact that Boyega's character is S- Stacker Pentecost's son, I guess, right. will hint at the direction they're taking the story, but I assume other characters have to come into play at some point. Or at least get mentioned. Mark, what do you think about this story, and what do you think are the chances that the reason Charlie Hunnam is not returning is because he's actually going back to the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise? <laughs> you know, John, uh, you guys are making a lot of great points about the actors in this movie and who's working on the story and the shooting locations. Let's not forget, it's giant robots that are going to be fighting a lot. <laughs> Next story. <laughs> I am so excited for this, and 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 I'm not I'm not paying for this movie, which is probably why I'm pumped for it. Because let's not forget the first Pacific Rim, at least in America, didn't do that well. Yep. It underperformed. I think it did better overseas. But the reason why we're only getting Pacific Two now is because people are a little cautious spending their money on a project like this because they wanted to have better returns than the first one did. I think adding some some talent, especially John Boyega right now, him injecting his personality into this movie, which Charlie Hunnam was not able to. Do, which maybe he couldn't do in the Fifty Shades of Grey movie either. <laughs> I think that's going to be a huge bonus for this movie. Getting to see the giant fight, sure, but I also want to see some sort of story, some sort of sense of humor. Yeah. I think we're going to get that in Pacific Rim 2, and I think you're going to be happy with I it. I wish I'd seen some sort of story in Pacific Rim 1, too. That would have been oh, nice. Come on! Go, coherent story would have been nice. dead man. <laughs> All right, folks, we reached out part of the show for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Sinead's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or salt. So, Sinead, what do we got? The casting and marketing for Power Rangers continues cranking it, cranking it up for the fans with the official Twitter account for Power Rangers tweeting early last night that Bill Hader has joined the cast of the movie as Alpha 5, the robot tasked with helping the Power Rangers. As of now, the report only says he will be doing voice work, so we won't know if Alpha 5 is pure CGI, practical effects, or a mixture of both, or if Hader will be doing any motion capture work. The movie lands in theaters on March 24th, 2017. Perry, do you buy or sell Bill Hader as Alpha 5 in Power Rangers. Obviously, I buy it. I'm a huge Power Rangers fan, and at this point, they can release just about anything, and I will buy it because I'm so, you know, fighting robots. So right now, I'm probably most excited for Power Rangers just below a specific ram, and like on the floor down there is Transformers. Sorry, Roka, not really. I love the fact that they put Bill Hader. I was thinking they would go something more along the lines of maybe a Josh Gad, because that character has such like a high-pitched, oh, yeah. silly yeah. voice. So I guess I'm a little surprised because I don't know now what they're going to make him do with it. If he's going to, because he's done a lot of voice work, but mm-hmm. even with the voice work that he's done, I guess BB-8 this doesn't really apply. But you know, I'm thinking to, of uh, Inside Out, where it still sounds like Bill Hader. You know, right. I mean that obviously does not come into play when you're talking about BB-8. But I'm just wondering if they're going to make him go. I don't want to say cartoonish, but I guess that's the only way to describe it when you compare his vocal range that we know to what Alpha 5 sounds like. And then there's the issue of uh, whether or not this character is going to be mocap or a physical robot. Part of me wants it to be like it was in the original, but based on what we've seen so far of the suits and of the Zords, I don't see that ever working in this kind of movie with the tone that I think Dean Israelite's going with. Yeah, um, I gotta sell this uh, because, not because of Bill Hader, I enjoy Bill Hader's work and just about anything he does. I'm gonna go on limb, he's not gonna go mocap or anything like that, he's, they're just gonna put him in a metal suit. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've always thought that, you know, Power Rangers could work if you do certain things with it, bring it up to a modern, you know, contextualize it a little bit better, stuff like that. I don't think, well, fits into that. And if they are doing that, that's going to be jarring, and I think that's going to be really unfortunate and make it for four-year-olds. And I, you know what? Those posters, I thought there was some merit to those posters. Seeing how the size and the scale of the Zords, I think that was pretty cool. It's like, you know, I've been very pessimistic about this whole project from the beginning, but, you know, there are elements I'm starting to see that go, you know what? Th- that could work, and they're doing some cool things here. And then this derails any momentum of my enthusiasm at this point. Again, not because of Hater, because he's great, but I just don't think they should include this character. Now, maybe they give us a totally different interpretation of Alpha 5. Mm-hmm. Maybe some black assassin, core, black in his soul, core robot or whatever, and he's like lethal and deadly and not silly. I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> on the surface, I gotta sell this, Roka. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Hashtag <laughs> black assassin. assassin. <laughs> Hashtag black assassin. No, here's what I'll say. Uh, uh, knowing the story of the Power Rangers and with Alpha 5, like Alpha 5 matures depending on what iteration you watch, right? Go, it, they, he gets older, he gets a little more mature. Initially, he's a naive childlike brother or assistant to the Rangers, and he says, ah, yeah, yeah, 
yeah, he does this thing that he does. So, but you cast Hater. Why do you cast Hater? Hater has a deeper voice. He can go higher and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. He does that, but he's really known for doing the lower stuff and playing around with that. So they might be just like you're saying, John. The thing the posters gave you that feeling that they're going a little more mature with this. They might be going a little more mature with Alpha Five as well by using Hater's deeper register or Hater's approach to it. He'll still have that sensibility, the comic sensibility, but he'd be able to stay in a certain range. And if you watch documentary now, any of that stuff, you he's so versatile in so many ways that why wouldn't you cast him? So I the question is, do I buy or sell Bill Hader's Alpha Five? I absolutely buy it. Yeah, see, I would buy it as well if he does the voice of Stefan for Alpha Five. That's really <laughs> what I think fans want. But I, look, I'm not a Power Rangers kid at all. I never grew up liking the Power Rangers, so I will defer to somebody like Perry who's more steeped in the war and actually has an appreciation for what it was. And if somebody like her, and I've seen a lot of fans online this morning talk about how excited they are that Bill Hader is being a part of this. So, John, I would be less concerned that it's going to be like an Alpha Five that's going to take you out of the movie. I think they're going to find a smart way to integrate Alpha Five into this new iteration of Power Rangers. Rangers, but also maybe retain a sense of humor or maybe be able to lighten the mood for the dark things that might happen to these Rangers. Now, if they do what you're suggesting, I'll change my mm -hmm. mind on it. I'll get into it. Because if he, maybe if Bill Hader, because he's done a lot of voice work, if he can build on that epic success as King of the Pigs and Angry Birds, <laughs> then we might be in for something really good. Okay, what's next? The first trailer has been released for the new comedy, Fist Fight. The movie stars Ice Cube and Charlie Day in a story about a mild-mannered high school English teacher trying his best to keep it together on the last day of school. But things go from bad to worse when he accidentally crosses his much tougher and deeply feared colleague, Ron Strickland, who challenges Campbell to an old-fashioned throwdown after school. The movie lands in theaters on February 17th, 2017. John, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Fist Fight? For a long time, other than Triple X 2, I've had like a philosophy in life that I will like anything Ice Cube is in, <laughs> and that streak ends today. Oh. I sell this trailer. I have but I've wa been looking forward to this trailer. I have wanted to like it. I, lo I love Jason Day. I love Ice Cube, Th these guys involved. But this trailer looks like a shtick that's gonna get tired in about two minutes. It honestly looked like a trailer for a seven minute skit. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you stretch this out over a whole movie. Now, that being said, we often have to give this little disclaimer. Bad trailers don't mean bad movies. You, we've often seen great movies come out of bad trailers and terrible movies come out of great trailers. So that we're just talking about the trailer here, but I was looking forward to this trailer. I love these guys involved with it, but this trailer did nothing for me personally. Perry, what about you? I'm actually gonna kind of strongly disagree. I'm gonna buy it, and not because I think this is the greatest trailer ever. There were no moments here where I laughed out loud, but I think Charlie Day and Ice Cube felt like people to a point where I was kind of curious what's going to happen between the two of them. And I like the quotes in the USA Today article from the director. He called it an R-rated John Hughes movie, which sounds really appealing to me. But that does, my, that's a cool quote. My that's mind cool for quote. this movie went immediately to Daddy's Home when I first heard about <laughs> it. So I wanted it to be as far away from that as possible. And it's and in when you compare the two trailers for those two movies, it's like Daddy's Home just relied on you know the same kind of shtick the two of them uh, Will Ferrell always does, or like the slapstick stuff we've seen time and time again this to me didn't seem to be fishing for laugh out loud moments it was kind of just presenting the general premise of the movie with with some humor that was pretty well woven into the presentation of the story so i give it a pass for that reason roca oh god i couldn't sell this anymore no. i mean i really couldn't i could take all your money and sell it even more like i just i can't this to me looks so bad it looks like another comedy where these all these great comedic actors are coming in and just getting a paycheck so they can pay for something on their house it just doesn't look that interesting that's to the me. next comedy by <laughs> yeah, the way right. paycheck <laughs> miles. but charlie day who was in pacific rim so I, I, I really like. I just to me it just it looks like a, 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 a I guess a remake of Three O'clock High. If people remember that '80s yeah. movie yeah. with Shamasco waiting for the fight and like what jazz. And we don't get we don't get the reasons why Ice Cube is beating. I mean that you should tell us the story in the trailer. What is the story? You know you get this whole. So it's it's it looks like and it looks like it's just going to be a bad film. I don't want to see a 2016 version of an R-rated John Hughes movie. And but here's the most amazing thing that we've discovered on the show. I have finally found my Mr. Glass. Perry and I are so different in our. <laughs> points of views. This is my unbreakable moment. Either she's Bruce Willis or I'm Sam Jackson or she's Sam Jackson. Because we just do not agree. I'm Sam Jackson. This, yeah, okay, fair enough. And this Mark. is 
Terrible. Mark, why is Rooker wrong about Charlie Day? <laughs> well, I, he's wrong I like about Charlie a lot Day. of things. And the unbreakable analogy parries the train because she's coming for you, Rooker. I mean, <laughs> the train. I got to agree. But I, I survived, can't wait I until this the becomes a meme. I, I'm, I'm with Perry. I don't think this trailer made the movie look great by any stretch of the imagination, but it's announcing this movie. And when you have two talents that I really appreciate in comedy, like Ice Cube and Charlie Day, I'm going to give it a pass, maybe against my better judgment, because I didn't laugh a lot watching this trailer. But as Campia pointed out, a lot of times, particularly, with comedies they don't give away the best jokes in the trailer and I appreciate when they do that so I'm more willing to be like okay I think it looks good enough it's got a February 17th release date which makes me nervous because that's like when Ice Cube would put out a ride along or a ride along too <laughs> which I don't like but I just there's something about this that charmed me to the point where I didn't feel like it was going to be an R-rated John Hughes movie that's for sure but I didn't need a lot of story I didn't need a lot of back and forth about what actually is going down I just wanted to see who the talent is involved make me laugh a couple times I did chuckle occasionally watching this trailer so I'm going to give it a very tentative buy. So we're split on the two sells, mm -hmm. two buys for this trailer. It's a comedy. Should Maybe it make we you should laugh in the fight. trailer? Yes, yeah, it should make you laugh <laughs> a little bit. All right, what's next? Jack Reacher Never Go Back TV Spots. The follow-up finds Tom Cruise's Jack Reacher, character, Jack Reacher character returning to his roots where he discovers that the women, the woman chosen to take over his role as the head of the MP, played by Kobe Smulders, has been arrested for espionage. The film opens in theaters on October 21st. Mark, do you buy or sell the new TV spots for Jack Reacher Never Go Back? Oh, I buy it because Jack Reacher has a really tough life, guys, because if he goes somewhere, <laughs> right, and then he moves on to somewhere else he's not like you and me where he can go back he can never go back <laughs> he always has to go somewhere new if he goes to vacation in hawaii guess what he's never going back to hawaii because he's jack reacher and i buy these spots enough i didn't like the first jack reacher movie i know john campia has it as one of his top three greatest films ever made <laughs> i just like the action enough and i'm a fan of tom cruise so i think that they're going to course correct for what the first movie was and these tv spots were an indication that i want to see him in another kick-ass action movie he's a great star right now in these kind of movies so i will give it a buy but again i'm a little nervous from that first movie i'm going to tell you why you're so wrong about jack i know i had the same relationship with jack reacher as i had with the equalizer like i watched it as like i didn't think anybody else liked it and i was the only guy who really did like i thought the combat sequences were great i thought the story was really well done uh, i liked you know the the villains and stuff like there was a little it was a little weak in the third act the third act got a little bit weak I'll, I'll give you that for sure but i've been looking forward to this and i like these spots i am so i'm gonna buy them i am gonna say this though i think it has finally happened it's taken forever but Tom Cruise no longer looks 27. <laughs> yeah. It's taken a long time. Yeah. He's finally starting to look his age <laughs> just a little bit. Like, he looks way better than I will at that age. But, I mean, he's finally starting. He doesn't look like he's 27. Well, he's years Jack Reacher. He can never go, go back. back. Yeah. <laughs> right. Perry. I'm really distracted by this image. Does that not look like it's photoshopped and, like, that could be a blue screen behind them? Like, I know that comes oh, from the trailer, yeah, but doesn't does. that look it, like a really weird image? It kind of looks like he's whispering sweet nothings into that gentleman's ear to make him fall asleep. <laughs> also looks it's like so that gentleman bad. has a wig on. Look at yeah. his Hairline. It's the guy I'm from sure Cobra Kai. All right, but it's, it's the kid from Cobra Kai. All grown we up. all sell could this be. picture. No, no, we uh, don't. The TV spots are fine. I have not seen Jack Reacher, so Jack Ryan. What are we talking Jack about? Reacher. Jack Reacher. Um, <laughs> Tell us, Mr. Glass. I have Glass. not seen it, but I remember when we were talking. We did a trailer review for the first trailer, and I'm like, okay, I'm into this. And these TV spots are basically just pieces of that exact trailer recut into T. And like all three of these TV spots are almost exactly the same. So they're very, very yeah. similar. I liked that trailer. I think they work well in the 30 second format. So I guess I buy it because it's decent marketing. Okay. I join. I I bought a ticket for the John Campia Patriots bandwagon train because I love Jack Reacher. <laughs> I loved this movie. I fought against all my friends about this movie because I enjoy Jack Reacher and I'm a I'm a huge I'm a homer for Tom Cruise. Like I go and uh, go see his movies all the time. I'm a big fan of his uh, for whatever outside whatever is outside. But I like what he does on screen and I enjoy his work. And Jack Reacher is a great character for him. Yeah, it's not like the book. He's not the same character as you see in the book. But he makes it. He still gave it life. And you're right. The action sequences were great. We get yeah. a pre Gone Girl Rosamond Pike playing a, a you know a, woman, a lawyer in distress. You have that, their chemistry going. And so he's so powerful. And, and that scene in New Orleans out on the street at night when they have the whole car chase and then he blends in and the crowd swallows him up because they understand. That was awesome. There was so much going on in this film that was so much fun. It's not your typical Tom Cruise action vehicle and it's what I enjoyed about it. And so I'm looking forward to this. This looks like a doubling down and you don't have and you have Colby Smulders but once again, smart casting. Colby's not going to take attention away from 
Tom Cruise. She's going to help Tom Cruise. She's going to have her own storyline and strong enough. But Tom is going to be the focus, and that's what these movies are and all the about. Other, the other co-star mm -hmm. of this will be his Apple box. <laughs> but, but, which, which is the other impressive thing about, I think, John Reacher. Because like, I, I like, see, see, Tom in movies like, like Collateral and yeah. things like that. He can be vicious and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, man, going to Jack Reacher, I thought, how will he be in hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes? Right. Will I buy that? Oh my God! Yeah, the the choreography and the way he he handled the choreo the fight choreography in that movie made me believe this dude. I don't care if he's six foot five or whatever height he is. He's a badass, and he made mm -hmm. me believe it. And so I hope they carry a lot. But of But you guys heard show. why Rosemont Pike's not in this movie, though, right? Because he's Jack Reacher. He never goes back. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Ellis nailed it. All right, guys. Well, listen. <laughs> Movie Talk <laughs> is not the only show going up here today. We also have another little episode mm. of the Movie Trivia Schmodown with uh, the wolf herself, Clark Wolf, taking on Josh the Wildman. Maku gets a part of the tournament. Make sure you check that out. That goes online. What time today? Is it going to uh, 2 o'clock today? 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Pacific Standard yeah. Time. That goes on. And don't forget, the weekend is here. That means episodes of Mailbag are coming on both Saturday and Wee. Sunday. Make sure you check that out. Now, listen, one of the films that we've been talking about a little bit recently is the biopic they've announced that they're going to be doing on the life of wrestler and, and the death of the wrestler, Chris Benoit, and wow. all the controversy surrounding that. It got announced that Lexi Alexander, who has directed episodes of, you know, she, well, she directed the movie Punisher Warzone, which I mm -hmm. think is drastically underrated. She's done some of the CW superhero shows. Now she's going back to feature films. She was nice enough to come into studio here and talk with us a little bit and we want to share a little clip of that discussion with you now check it out I remember way back in the day there was uh, you know everybody in Hollywood took Ambien uh, do you remember that <laughs> no, yeah. like I mean and I still like tweet sometimes like god I miss Ambien because at <laughs> then though I took it and it was great because all of a sudden everybody was sleeping and all the actors and all the directors we were all talking about how great Ambien is right but then you started like hearing stories you know right. of being crazy okay <laughs> and then somebody told me a story of me being crazy of me literally walking out in the middle of the night and I woke up the next day blood all over my face apparently I took it but didn't go straight to bed and did something on my computer and then I walked around in a hotel cutting my eye on some frame Ooh, outside wow. and like you know I had no memory and I talked to other friends and I went on to forums and there were people saying they woke up in the neighbor's house they they ate every night and only realized it when a camera was put in and so I, I mean I'm fascinated with things that we can do under uh, certain medications when when we don't have ourselves in control when we don't function you know, normally. And so, I mean, at some point, I even found a case of a guy who was the nicest, most normal dude you, you, you can meet. And not a bad story about him, not even a fight in school. On Ambient, went to the next house and killed two people with a knife like this. Wow. I couldn't remember any of it. And so I, I do, it's not an excuse I have. I'm the last person who would excuse somebody of domestic violence. That That's not my game. I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, uh, this is not what I stand for, but I do say this, that you can turn your brain into working against you if you make mistakes. Our full conversation with Lexi is up and online on our Collider Video YouTube channel. Go and check that out. It's a fascinating discussion. Check that out. Hey, listen, guys, I want to remind you, we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday. And at the end of the show, we like to save a little bit of time to take your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. And you can start sending in some questions right now. Wendy's back there monitoring all the messages you're sending in. She'll pick out a few for us to ask at the end of the show. But for now, it's time for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We take one or two questions every day. So which one are we taking today, Sinead? Sam Dean writes, hello, Collider. Keep up the great work. Something that has become very noticeable in the box office is the complete underperformance of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, especially in comparison to its predecessor. The sequel made $239,192,233 worldwide. <laughs> a significant, that took a minute, a significant drop down from the predecessor's $493,333,584. What about sense? Do you think this incarnation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is dead or will we see a threequel in the years to come? Lazy statistics. Like, if you're not going to give us the amount of sense, <laughs> I mean, why seriously. bother? <laughs> Just say bunch of money if you're not going to get specific about it. Um, yeah, look, you know what?
But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the, the, the newest incarnations of them, I remember I was, because of all the reports and everything, I was down on the idea. I did not like the idea of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then that first one came out, and it's funny because Schnepp and I both, we were in and see the and we were like, that was actually kind of fun. Like, I was shocked. I had fun with that first one. So then I go in to see the second one with high expectations and anticipation. Didn't really do... I didn't dislike the film, but it was certainly a step down, I felt, from the original. I, th I felt they started going... I, I felt like in the first one, they had a nice balance between, hey, going for mature audiences are going to like this and have enough in there for that the kids are going to like too. And then I felt like in the second one, they went way in the other direction. Just make this for five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. I felt like they did that with the second one. And... It had some decent entertainment to it, but again, I thought it was a step backwards. Yeah, and I think the box office reflects that. The word of mouth reflected that. I personally think that that's probably it for this run in incarnation of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What do you think, Mark? I mean, that's the big question because I felt like out of the shadows, while I did have some fun watching it, it just wasted a lot of characters. I was looking forward to like Bebop and Rocksteady, and particularly Krang was just like a pretty much a no-show, as was Shredder in that movie. And I'm thinking like if you made a third one, could you be unlike Jack Reach and actually go back? to giving us the characters that we want to see, particularly from the animated series, which is what I'm a big fan of. That's clearly the vibe that they were going for. I just don't know if it's if it's too late to do so now. I'd like to see them attempt a third one. I really would. So I think there's enough potential in there to give us a full turtle movie. We just haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I think as long as, once again, they make sure Shredder does nothing in the movie, then I'm sure they'll be on the right ah. track. Yeah, that yeah. hurt. Anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I think so, too. I, I wasn't the biggest fan of the first one, but I could see why people liked it. I understood why people liked it, you know, and I got why you would do a sequel. And I personally was stoked for my friend Gary Anthony Williams, who was going to play, uh, I think, Bebop. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to see the second one, and I thought they were going to course correct. I thought they they were going to go a little more darker, a little more of a mature film. And you walked in, you're right, John, it's a film for five-year-olds. And you're just like, oh, man, I thought they were course correct in the other way. So for me, this feels like this is it. Uh, unless there's some kind of groundswell to get a, a, a three one a, a, a three threequel in, then great. But to me, it doesn't seem like it's set up to do that at this point, and they'll let it die for and a little Casey bit. And Casey Jones back. is wasted too. Yeah, I mean, it, they it's could like, have done more. Right. So right. Casey, yeah. seeing Stephen Amell is I mean, he's barely in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Perry, is this incarnation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles dead? My favorite things growing up were Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles. So I will <laughs> never say no to another Ninja Turtles movie. We are not getting a third mm. movie in this mm. series of Ninja Turtles movies though it's never happening the box office reflects it big time i didn't have a big problem with these two movies i i agree that they do have issues particularly yes roca you're making faces at me. <laughs> i i agree they have major villain problems but when these movies are at their best is when they focus on the turtles and not mm. the human characters so if they Especially did make Megan. this third movie that's never going to happen and they just focused on the turtles, I think they could have a good movie because the turtles look great. They sound I great. I thought they looked I really love good. the action. I mean, I just love looking at the detail on the turtles. It really, I just, I'm all for the visual effects that were done on this movie, on this series, but... Mm -hmm. We're never getting a third movie. Yeah. I will bet just about anything I have on it. All right, folks. So listen, it uh -huh. is Friday. Which means it's time for our box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. What we are going to uh, probably poorly do here is try to predict for you what the top five films of the box office are going to be come Monday morning. Now, Perry has sounded very confident all morning about oh. her box office predictions. So, Perry, That's we're going to start I off with go you. first. You're going to cheat. Oh, no, we're no, going to lead kidding. off I'm with you. Kidding. All right. I think I got this. I take this very seriously if you have noticed. <laughs> yes. I'm going Magnificent Seven at number one, thinking, you know, what could, a shock. could yeah. get 40, 40 million. Storks, I think, is going to do very well, too. Maybe get 30. Sully is going to be number three. Where I could mess this up now is four and five, Snowden and Bridget Jones's baby. And I think I'm going to put Snowden at number four and Bridget Jones at five because one had the better per theater average and has the higher cinema score, so I think I'm going to use those as my, my way to decide between the two. You could not be more wrong. <laughs> Here's same. how That's it's same. really going to break down. Actually, mine is almost identical to hers with one minor <laughs> difference. I am also going to go Magnificent Seven, number one. Never underestimate a new animated movie coming out, but mm. the previews have not been strong for Storks. The movie is better than the previews let on, so you could see a strong second weekend performance for Storks, but I do think Magnificent Seven is going to win the weekend, followed by Storks, followed by Sully, 
Bridget Jones's baby, I think, is going to surprise people, and I think it's going to come in at the uh, number three spot. Then you've Ooh. got Snowden, and then you've got uh, Don't Breathe. Oh, wow. oh, you went to six. All right. Oh, did I go six? Wait, you went to six. Uh, no, wait, what did I do? I did I Magnus think you seven. Sully. Storks. Yeah. Sully. Sorry, Sully. I did oh. say Sully number yeah, you three. Did say Sully. Bridget Jones four. Snowden five. Yeah. Okay. So I so no, it's same you, as yours, except I'm flipping Bridget Jones with you. And you could be right. That's where I'm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Roko? Yeah, my list is exactly the same as John Campia, so there's no need for it to go forward. I mean, I, I just think Bridget Jones' baby is the bad moms of this section of movie-going time in this year. It is surprising people. It's getting good reviews. It's 76% of Rotten Tomatoes. People are And men are coming out saying that they actually enjoyed this movie. So it's kind of interesting to me. There is more of a groundswell than people think for this movie, and it is going to maintain its status because women are going to it dates things that if it leads into fall it'll be perfect and it'll make its money and it'll keep going it was much better than i thought it was yeah, going this, to be this is what i hear from everyone yeah. mark your uh, predictions the magnificent seven is going to be number one guys and then i'm proud to say that storks stand up for birds everywhere and get their revenge on the evil sully sullenberger who so ruthlessly <laughs> killed a number of their people they're going to be number two sully's going to be number three i have bridget jones at four and i have blair witch Ooh. at five. Oh, she's not a fan of teenagers but she's going to be doing just fine mm. in the second week of release yeah. or it's not going to make that much money but it'll be number five <laughs> all right guys well i said we'd save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live twitter questions and we're going to do that right now you still might have some time to sneak one or two in follow us on twitter at collider video send them in make sure you're kissing up to wendy because she's the one who makes the decisions around here wendy what do we got all right kelvin duncan says buy or sell christopher reeve biopic he was just an aspiring after his accident if not more i think he deserves one I would completely buy it if for no other reason. If, if you know about the history of uh, him and Robin Williams, like all the way back to college and how their like careers got started together, I think there's fascinating stories to tell there. Not just at the end of his life, but in the beginning, the middle parts of his career, Superman was a phenomena that we hadn't seen before. It makes you believe a man could fly. I absolutely, I think there's some really rich storytelling with that life story, so I would totally buy it. I am all for it also. Also, because based on what you just said too, I'm someone who only knows kind of surface level information. I'd really like to dig a little deeper and know about some of these stories. Roka. Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you want to explore this stuff? There's so much that it touches on, so many uh, walks of life it could touch on, so many parts of Hollywood it could touch on, and, and you get this idea of the progression of a character, or, I mean, a person coming to this uh, level of fame, so why not? It'd be fun to see that, what, what they could explore with that. What, am I going to say no? Come on, yeah, <laughs> of course. I would, I would love to see that. It does make me nervous, though, if you're casting. Christopher Reeve, I think you can cast, and you can have, find somebody that can play Christopher Reeve. Right. It's, it's a tall order to cast somebody to play Robin Williams, yeah. even in a bit part, as oh. his Oh, yeah. roommate or as is you know when they went to Juilliard together that's a tall order man it is uh -huh. an odd couple vibe to it too right because Christopher Reeve comes off as this composed leading man yep. mm -hmm. and you have the slavish mm -hmm. very funny Robin Williams who's at Harry Wolf you know uh, just <laughs> as a side note um, speaking of of these amazing characters is that if you go back like this is long after Superman, but he did this little film. I always say I switch my favorite comedy of all time is always jumping back and forth between two films. One is 40 Year Old Virgin, and one is Noises Off. Mm -hmm. yeah. That Christopher Reeve did yeah. with John Ritter, Carol mm -hmm. Burnett, play, yeah. Michael Caine. It's amazing. If yeah. you have not seen Noises Off, find a way to watch it. I think you will absolutely love it. All right, what's next? Kevin M. says, is it possible summer 2017 can be as disappointing as 2016? Wonder Woman, Kingsman, Spider-Man, Dunkirk, and Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and etc. Well, I mean, look, I've had this discussion with a few people recently. This was actually a pretty damn good summer for movies. The th problem is that the average person goes to two to three movies in a summer. And if those two to three movies you went to go see just happened to be Independence Day... Yeah. Which wasn't uh, that bad. Uh -huh. Suicide Squad. Uh, yeah. And then maybe one of the other three ones. And it, yeah, there Apocalypse. were some disappointments. Yeah, yeah X-Men Apocalypse. If those were the th only three movies you saw this summer, then you it would be understandable that you'd sit back and go say, wow, this was a disappointing summer for movies. But there were some gems that came out this summer. I think a couple of the, some of the films that I think are going to be at the end of the year are still considered some of the best films of the year. When you But the list you gave off for 2017... I think three out of the four of them are can't miss. I really, like, come on, Dunkirk, of course that's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is going to be awesome. Wonder Woman's a little bit of a question mark, but damn, I love the trailer for that. So, no, I do think the summer of 2017 will be better. Perry, what do you think? I heard what you just said about Independence Day Resurgence. I, you thought you mumbled it. No. Yeah, that doesn't go on. No, 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 I, no, no, I will no. absolutely defend no, the no, no, first no. hour and 40 minutes of that movie. 
Wow. I had such a blast. And then the last half we of the movie, I was like, what this. just happened? Absolutely, we should He's going to have nobody this. to talk hey, to. Hey, by the way, we like can, we should all go out to lunch together considering this is John Roca's final episode. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, we should probably do something to commemorate it. Have lunch. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt? Hey, Sir Perry, you weren't finished. <laughs> well... I don't think this summer was that disappointing because it was also mm. very front-loaded, too. If we're just looking at the big box office ones, the big studio movies, most of the better ones just came out when it was kind of like fake summer. At the yeah, end of, when it the was end of April summer. and the beginning of May. <laughs> I'm really excited for next summer. There's tons of stuff here. And uh, to add on to the ones that you just said, I'll throw in uh, Kingsman. I'm really no, pumped abs- for yeah, Kingsman. Yeah. I, I, I think wait. that could wind up being kind of a, not really a surprise hit because the first one was a hit, but I mean a surprise hit in between a whole bunch of really high profile superhero movies. Roka. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be a fun summer next summer. And this is the way it goes in the movie business. If you live long enough and you watch these summers. I'm sorry, your lips rare. are moving, but all I hear is, I liked yeah. Independence Day Resurgence. That's all I hear. I, uh, oh, all right, calm it down. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, like, uh, I think it's going to be. And this is what happens. You'll have a down year, but then the studios come back and have an up year. It's just how it works. It's just, it, the, I don't know. You can't explain it. Like uh, Jeffrey Rush said in Shakespeare in Love, it just what happens that way. You can't explain it. And I think that's the thing that's interesting about looking forward to next year. I think the studios are paying more attention. They're more focused. It's what happens, right? People go, and what you were saying, John, is true. Like, if you only went to see three, four films this year and they weren't that great, they didn't reach you meet your expectations, and you were down, you said, it's a bad year. Yeah, because you only went to see those films. But one of the things you talked about on Facebook the other day is like, I spent 10 years trying to convince people to watch comic book movies. Now I feel like I'm trying to convince people to watch other movies. And yeah. that's what's the summer. If you look at the entire slate of movies, there were a lot of really good movies that were not studio ten pole pictures. So if you're going to talk to me about the summer, go through every movie. Movie, and then look at the balance and see if for real this was a really bad summer and I don't think it's as bad as people have been portraying it to be. Mark? When you cash that check from Roland Emmerich for 13 <laughs> I really hope it's worth it. I think that this summer was disappointing. I think that there were some gems for sure but man did we have to go prospecting for the gold that we got like Hell or High Water and Kuba right. and the Two Strings. I love those movies but they weren't the ones that we were getting amped for in February. That's what this question is referring to is are the big blockbusters going to be as disappointing because I I didn't hate Suicide Squad. I didn't hate a lot of these movies that came out, but they were letdowns to me. I don't think Wonder Woman is going to let me down. I don't think Dunkirk will. I don't think Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will. I think Spider-Man Homecoming might be the best movie of the summer. So there's a lot to look forward to. I think the blockbusters are going to be better than they were in 2016. Wendy, what about you? Well, you and Sinead both. Like, What movies out of next summer are you looking forward to the most? Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> Sinead? Uh, yeah, it's got to be either Wonder Woman, that trailer is still like my favorite trailer of the whole year, yeah. or uh, Spider-Man. All right, let's take mm. one more Twitter question today. All right, Frank Torres says, if you could design your own movie theater, Mark, what new features, services, products would you implement? Oh, I've thought about this a lot. I have really <laughs> put a lot of thought into this. First of all, I hate when people talk in movie theaters. I can't stand it. I can't stand cell phones coming out. So what we have is we have at the front, we have two docking stations where bears are. And if, <laughs> if you now one's going to be a live bear, one's going to be a guy in a bear suit. So you never know which side you're going to get. But if you take your cell phone out once, you get immediately hushed. OK, a, a spotlight shines on the person so they get shamed in public. If they do it again, that's when we unleash the bear. <laughs> What about you, Roka? What, what feature do you put into a theater? There's so many. I mean, I would take the arc light, make it a 70 millimeter screen. I would install huge leather seats that you see now going into these higher end theaters like the IPIC in Pasadena, where you can sit and then you have people bringing you food. I take your cell phone idea and go the next level that you check in your cell phone at the beginning of the movie. Give it when to you a walk, bear you give up front. It, well, no, but you put it into a <laughs> slot. And if you need, if you've got an emergency situation, if you've got somebody that's called, then your, your theater seat is assigned. A person is there. They call the theater, blah, 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 and she just had her baby, blah, 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 he's got, uh, he got some kind of condition or a car accident. They come and tell you, they steer you out of the theater, no one gets disturbed. I'm so sick of seeing cell phones come out in theaters now. I would love to see insane. somebody walk up to Roka, excuse me, your baby was just born. <laughs> 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 Which begs the question, if your wife was that pregnant, why are you at a movie alone? Hey, have you ever first nine months, so you gotta take a break. Um, you know? Honey, <laughs> this is taking all day. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I just go um, see this comedy? <laughs> I well, the first thing I, that I've been screaming for for years is what like AMC Theaters is now I think doing in all their theaters in New York, which is pre-assigned seating mm-hmm. every movie theater yep. without exception. This is not the dark ages. You go on a plane, you go to a concert, you go to the theater, you know where your seat is. Why we haven't done that in all movie theaters, and we see AMC do 
doing that with theaters like the Arc Light yeah. doing that. That's great. I, s simple cell phone jammer. I, I would put a cell phone oh. jammer in everything. That's the good. moment you step out of the theater, it turns back on. You're good to go. But I, but I'm sorry, unless your name is Mr. President. Like, you don't have to be reached on a moment's notice. You can wait for 35 minutes before you get your message. I would have cell phone jammers in all the theaters. My idea doesn't even need the bears because I just want my personal prime bubble. I just want to oh. be by myself yeah. in a super comfortable seat with the best projection, best audio. And maybe let, allow cats. Can like I sit with a cat on oh, my you lap? Lost wait, me. wait, wait, okay. You lost me. You're so almost there. Allow well, it's my personal prime bubble. Oh, this so is right. My, this is your my bubble. That's has right. no effect on you. And then oh. right in front of my seat, I want an Alamo draft house like bar setting mm. where I can put my little shit and get my beer and my pizza. Oh my god, I want I would be very happy in this little bubble. See, but the only thing the only thing I don't agree with you at is that I love to this day, I've loved this since I was a kid and I love it to this day. I love the crowd at a movie mm -hmm. theater. Absolutely. I just I love being with a bunch of people and laughing together and being in shock together. And you know, I love a true story. I mean, when I saw Life Is Beautiful in the theater, there were a couple of Hell's Angels in the theater. This is in Saskatoon where they have a chapter. There was a couple of Hell's Angels in Life Is Beautiful, and the dudes were crying at the end. And it's just like you got all these strangers sharing this experience together. I love that nature of the movie going experience. So I I still want to have it's that. A fair nice point, out, but know. I feel like if I weighed the percentages between having a good communal experience and one that kind of bothers me. One one might outweigh the one other. One might mm -hmm. outweigh the other. Well, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, the most important part of our show is not what we have to say, it's what you have to say. Make sure you jump into the comment section of this video and leave your thoughts on any or all of the topics that we discussed here today. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, starting on my left is Perry. Perry, where can people find you online? You guys can catch me trying to sneak my cat into movie theaters and at P. Nemiroff <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. Best of the week every Saturday and Collider Nightmares every Tuesday. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. John Roca. John, where can we find you? Hey, guys, you can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Wednesday here on Collider. We drop the top 10 show with me and Matt Nost. Please subscribe and download my new podcast, The Cinephiles, where we discuss one classic film before the year 2000 over an hour. And I'm announcing for the first time that we just got the go-ahead last night, my new show, Super Animation Game Time with Yuri Lowenthal. We're coming back. We used to be cast of characters. We're going to be a geek and sundry on the Twitch channel. We're going to we're going to announcement coming soon in terms of when we're... October 5th is the day. We don't know the time yet, but we're going to be coming back and interviewing people who have done a lot of work in voiceover animation and in video games. So over then the nice. end, Mark. Mark, where can people find you? Well, I'll be rolling out of bed early to do mailbag this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And Saturday night, I'll be at the World Famous Comedy Store on Sunset Strip. You guys can get tickets at markellislive.com. And if you use the promo code SCHMOES, you get a discount. See you all there. The people steering the ship at that table there, starting with Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that so Sinead.com. I'm hanging out with Mark this weekend on Mailbag, here on Mondays hosting Collider TV Talk, and on Fridays hosting Movie Talk. And Wendy. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at John Campy. And make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ, where me and John Schnepp have our show, Film HQ. And that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campy, and until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.